Okay, in today's lecture, we're going to be learning about energy in the ecosystem and how there's different levels of energy um, at different levels of food chains and the food webs that can happen in the ecosystem. Uh, as well as learning about those different levels, we're going to learn their names, um, some of the energy rules, um, and why we should be protecting certain pieces of our ecosystem along the way. Now, first off, um, one of the big things that I was learning about while I was watching people do notes was... Um, how do we take the notes? So again, make sure that on the left column, you write down the bolded definition on each slide. And on the right hand column, you write down any examples or extensions that are going to help you remember either written on the slide or something that I say, and make sure that you're watching along with the pictures. Um, there's also going to be questions on the slides. I'm going to pose them in the question or in the lecture, um, but I'm going to ask them at the end of the class. And then um, if you guys have any more questions on them, please come and ask me. So to start off, we're going to talk about producers and autotrophs. So producers and autotrophs um, are organisms that get their energy from non-living sources. One of the big examples we have here are plants, um, since they produce energy by using the sun. Um, now, plants are not the only producers that exist in food chains. Um, we have things that also chemosynthesize, meaning that they take chemical um, energy. Uh, they use heats and other chemicals to create energy um, from that from those sources. Um, but particularly in what we're going to be talking about is we're going to be talking about plants and how those end up producing energy for the food chain. So the question here is, do you think that there are a limit to the amount of energy a producer can create? Now, Producers produce energy that then get consumed by the consumers, also known as heterotrophs. So consumers, known as heterotrophs, um, get their energy by consuming other living things. So for example, humans are consumers since we eat plants and animals to get our energy. Now, we can choose to eat plants, we can choose to eat animals, but we can't photosynthesize, which makes us a consumer or a heterotroph. Uh, there's oftentimes some confusion going, well, what's the difference between a vegetarian and somebody who eats meat with humans? And we'll talk about that in a little bit. But the question to answer here is, is there a limit to the amount of energy that a consumer can get? Um, looking back at what the producers do, is there a limit to the amount of energy then that a consumer can get by having to consume other living things? Now, you take a producer, you add various levels of consumers to that, and you end up with a food chain, um, which is similar to what we did in the online lab, where we had the plants, uh, which was the grass, and our consumers, which were the rabbit, the snake, and then the hawk. So a food chain is a sequence that links species by their feeding relationships. Um, arrows point from what is being eaten to what is doing the eating. Um, and that's important to make sure that you draw your arrows that way. So the arrow would go from the grass to the rabbit, then the rabbit to the snake. Specialist organisms only eat one type of organism, while generalists eat a range of different organisms. Humans are generalists. We can eat plants or animals. However, cats are actually based on eating only uh, meat, so they are more specialized in what they have to eat. We have different uh, things that we can eat. Some things have only specific. Make sure that you know that because it, it makes it really, really important when we look at energy um, pyramids, food webs, food chains, and interactions in the ecosystem. Now here's our example of the food chain, except we subbed out a couple of things in here from the online lab to make it a little bit more complex. But the grasshoppers would then eat the plants, so those grasshoppers eating those little uh, dandelions and grass that are there. Mice eat grasshoppers, snakes eat mice, and then the eagles then eat the snakes. Um, and if you look at the arrows, you'll see the arrows pointing from what is getting eaten to what is doing the eating, so the, from the grass to the grasshopper, and all the way down the line. Now. Things that only eat plants are known as herbivores. So mice, horses, some insects, they fall under this category of things that only eat plants. Herbivores, um, herb standing for plants, vores meaning eating. Um, and they're usually found lower in the food chain, usually right above where the producers are. Um, so in our question here is that are humans considered herbivores? Um, we're going to learn more about how to answer that question in just a bit. Now, carnivores are consumers that only eat animals as a source of energy, um, making a big distinction here that they do not eat plants as a source of energy. They only eat animals. Um, they're usually found on higher levels of the food chain. Snakes, hawks, and lions are examples of this. I mentioned cats earlier. Um, they are specific uh, in what they eat more because they will only eat other animals. Um, just like the herbivores will only eat plants. So the question here is, what are some common characteristics among carnivores? 
Now we have where humans are, which is we are omnivores. Omnivores are consumers that get energy from both plants and animals. So I can eat a salad, I can also eat a steak, and I can get energy from both of those um, to go ahead and live. So my question is, is that why would there be a benefit to being an omnivore? Um, when there is a lot of plants, there are a lot of animals that exist, um, and we have a lot of things that we can eat, but why is there a benefit to being an omnivore over a, you know, we have cows, we have lettuce, and we have spinach and other plants. Why is it a benefit for us to be able to eat both? Um, and there is actually a cool thing too. If you want to right now as a way to uh, remember why you're an omnivore, if you look at your front teeth and you compare your front teeth to a horse or a cow, you'll know they're similar because they're actually meant to clip into leaves to eat them. And if you look at where your canines are right behind your front four teeth um, on either side and into the back, you'll notice they're sharp. And those teeth are actually meant to tear into meat. Um, human's mouth evolved to be able to have both plant eating teeth and uh, animal eating teeth in the same mouth. Um, and it's kind of unique. So uh, take a look at that if you want to right now. Now, finally, this doesn't really fall into the food chains and food webs very often, um, but they are incredibly important. In fact, I would say they're the most important organisms um, are decomposers. Decomposers are organisms that eat and break down dead matter into smaller compounds and energy. So what they live off is off the dead. When we look at mushrooms, we look at um, worms and things like that. Um, what we end up having are these things that decompose and they break down food that's dead. Um, and then those, or the nutrients that are produced there allow for producers to go ahead and grow on top of them. So my question here is describe the circle of life based on what we just learned. Um, I've been quoting Lion King. I've been saying Lion King in class for the past couple of days. Um, circle of life. Um, how is decomposer? How are decomposers attached to that circle of life? Um, knowing that we have producers and then now consumers as well. Now, we organize all of these different parts of the food chain. We end up with something that's known as trophic levels. Um, so trophic levels are the levels of nourishment or food in a food chain. Generally, the amount of energy for the food chains are available much higher at the producer level and decrease at each level as they move up the food chain. The correct uh, um, the correct measurement for this is actually something known as like a 10% rule. Um, so it's roughly around 10%, saying that there's only 10% of the energy available as you move up the chain. So 100% of the energy at the producer's level, 10% at the primary consumers, 1% at the pr uh, secondary consumers, and then 0.1% at the tertiary consumers. And that's really important when we look at how specialized different organisms are and how many organisms exist at different levels of the food chain. So it goes for producers, producer, the arrow pointing to the primary consumer, again, pointing to where the energy is going, pointing to what is doing the eating. Producers, primary consumers, secondary consumers, and then tertiary consumers. Um, I'm going to say right now, please write down producers, primary consumers, secondary consumers, and tertiary consumers in the right-hand column of trophic levels so that you know this. Um, in case that wasn't going to work for you either, you have this pyramid here. Um, and I really like this pyramid because it illustrates the 10% rule on the right hand side. It illustrates biomass and the numbers on the left hand side, um, because there's a decrease in the amount of organisms that exist as you move up the chain. The amount of organisms is the biomass. And it also gives examples of different primary, secondary, tertiary consumers, as well as producers in a food web that you could actually draw here using this pyramid. Um, if you look here, you got your primary consumers um, being the house mouse, the red bellied uh, lethorix, the ch red chested sided warbler, the scarlet tanager, um, eating the green peas and the huckleberries. Those primary consumers are going to eat me by the red panda, the grizzly bear, the bald eagles. And then the bald eagles are also tertiary consumers because bald eagles can also consume um, things in the secondary consumer route as well. So please make sure that you are looking at this pyramid and you understand both the left and the right hand side with the percentages and the biomass. Finally, we're going to end it up with food webs. Uh, a food web is a model that shows the complex networks of feeding relationships and the flow of energy within the ecosystem. So most organisms eat more than one thing and they intersect in food chains as a result. So my thing is how can we make one of these with our own food choices as humans? And that takes us to the end of the video. Um, please respond to the question that's attached to this video on Google Classroom um, and make sure you ask any questions to me um, as the class is going on. Thank you for listening. Have a good day.